All right, so he received worship, and um, I'll give you a list of uh, these things here. He received worship first from angels. All right, did I give that, give that to you yet? I didn't even get past, I didn't even get to one point under worship. Here we go. We got a lot to look at. Letter A, he received worship from angels. Hebrews 1, 6. He received worship, letter A, from angels. Hebrews 1, 6. We're almost there right now, so let's just flip back and read that. <clears throat> Where, um, the, By the way, here, Hebrews 1 um, has lots of Old Testament uh, passages that are cited or quoted in it. So when you're reading Hebrews 1 and even Hebrews 2, get, get, get your cross-reference uh, mindset ready because you're going to be going back and forth to the Old Testament a lot here. Uh, Hebrews 1, 6, though, and again, he, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, let all the angels of God worship him. So uh, this is uh, an important uh, uh, reference here. Um, Deuteronomy 32.43, Deuteronomy 32, 32.43. Uh, rejoice, all ye nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his uh, servants and render vengeance to his adversaries and be merciful unto his land and to his people. Uh, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, so next, letter B. Um, from the, uh, the multitudes of heaven, multitudes of heaven uh, worship him. Multitudes of heaven worship him. Nehemiah 9.6, Nehemiah Let's go ahead and read, uh, let's read a couple of verses here, Nehemiah 9, 6. Ben, why don't you read verse 5? <laughs> then the Levites. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. You're doing good. Keep going. And Cadmiel. Yep. Amen. Benai. Yes, sir. Ash Excellent. <laughs> Sherebiah. Pretty good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, giving you some uh, future names for your boys here. <laughs> Pretty good. Yeah, very good. That's good. The Ah family there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to give you some. <laughs> want to give you some context. <laughs> because context is very important when you're interpreting scripture. If you don't have context, you don't even know what we're talking about. You know what I'm saying? So. <laughs> Very good, very good. Okay, thank you, Ben. Yep, yeah, I'll let you keep going there. Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever, and bless should be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Okay, then verse 6, Thou, even thou art Lord alone, thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein, thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worshipeth thee. So, um, the host of heaven worship thee. That's Nehemiah 9, 6. Hebrews 1, 6 talks about the first begotten being worshipped by the angels of God. Okay, so you see how that God receives worship, and so does the first begotten of God receive worship. Okay, uh, next uh, class period, Ben, I'll have you read Esther 8, 9. So get ready for that one. If you want to memorize that, that's be fine too. Um, anyway, uh, number C, letter C, he, he, he received worship from everyone, from everyone. We won't look back there, but you know Philippians 2, 10, and 11, right? 
Let's look back, compare that to Isaiah 45, 22. Isaiah 45, 22. Look unto me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. Anybody know any historical illustrations from that verse? Anybody know any historical illustrations from that? Ring a bell, Jordan. The serpent on the pole. Okay, yeah, sure. There's an Old Testament reference to that looking to me, and that comes from that. Um, that, that was a very generic question I just asked. I'll just say it like this. That is the text that the man preached... Uh, when Spurgeon went into that to chapel that day, and uh, the the real pre the main preacher couldn't make it in, and somebody finally stood up and preached. That's the text that they preached from, and uh, catch a Spurgeon sermon on that passage, and you'll hear his, you'll hear the real Spurgeon come rolling out, looking to me, be saved, all the ends of the earth. But certainly that is look and live. That has that uh, that has that. Uh, reference back there. Uh, <clears throat> but look here, um, verse 20, uh, 23. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. So here, reference to God, and in uh, Philippians 2, 10, 11, in reference to Jesus Christ. Let's look at uh, Matthew 2, 11. Matthew 2, 11. Matthew 2.11. Verse 10, When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. (laughs) Seeing the star meant something. It meant that they were going to uh, be less rich than what they were before they saw the star because they had, uh, they had put together uh, expensive gifts and they were going to give those gifts. And that star, which represented the child, was their opportunity to give money and worship and they were ex- had exceeding great joy when it's your opportunity to give the Lord worship and your sacrificial money, do you do that with exceeding great joy? Is it exceeding great joy that you bring your worship and your uh, monetary gifts to God? God loves, guess what type of a giver? He loves a cheerful giver. He loves a cheerful giver. And uh, so verse 11, when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And they opened their treasures. They opened their treasures with exceeding great joy. And uh, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So uh, I think the point here, among other things, besides the fact that the young child was worshipped, is that we joyfully spend our time on money and money on the things that we love. We do that joyfully. So what brings you joy when you do it? Um, It's a good test for us. It's a good test. You know know what makes you really joyful. We all do. We all do. I I always feel pity the people when you read their obituary. They talk about, yes, and he was buried in a Pittsburgh Steelers casket with his such and such jersey. I mean, you hear that a lot. I mean, I like the Steelers and stuff, but I mean, okay, that's that's their life. That's their that's what brought them joy. Pit, a, a, a sports team, and uh, that's fairly common um, situation. So. Ask yourself what brings you great joy. And these wise men uh, spent their time, their, 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 their money uh, on the Lord. 
And so that's a great uh, truth there. They worship this child. How about Matthew 8.2? Let's look five, uh, verses, five chapters later. Matthew 8.2, another uh, illustration or time where we see the <clears throat> Lord receiving worship is here, uh, we, we referenced this earlier, but uh, hard for us to picture a leper today, um, you know, someone that, that was like this and looked like this, they're not going to be out in the public eye today. And uh, I don't know how this guy got away from where he was at, how he got this way, but uh, he made uh, certainly the concerted effort to be near the Lord when he was, verse 1, come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him, and behold, there came a leper and worshipped him. I'm guessing the crowd parted a little bit uh, when they saw that guy stumbling with his disease-filled bandages wrapped around him and probably fairly disfigured. Uh, Let's look at Exodus 4, 6. Exodus 4, 6. Exodus 4, 6. And the Lord said, Furthermore unto him, put now thy hand in thy bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom, and when he took it out, his hand was leprous as snow. So uh, we have leprosy through uh, the Old Testament, through the New Testament, um, as many as uh, 21 different people uh, are individually cited as having leprosy through the course uh, of the Scripture, and we know how uh, it caused people to be quarantined. Um, But anyway, back to Matthew 8, 2, uh, leprosy, there came a leper and worshipped him. The leper worshipped him and uh, called him Lord. And uh, <clears throat> if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And uh, so this idea of, of being clean was, uh, uh, was going to be um, something that the leper hadn't known for a long time, just like the lady who was bowed over hadn't known what it meant to stand up straight. Thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And uh, so great healing there. One of so many things that Jesus did that it gets just a small uh, portion of Scripture, but the the effect of that was um, should not be underestimated what that was about. The leper worshipped him. And Jesus received that worship. Uh, Next is the next chapter, chapter 9, verse 18. Chapter 9, verse 18. All right, so we have the woman bowed over. What What a great need she had. We had the leprous man. What a great need he had. But this man probably had as much of a need and, and was as much, more, as much concerned for his situation than the others, even though it didn't involve him, it involved his daughter. Matthew 9, 18. Here we have a man whose daughter um, is the issue. And while he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler, a civil ruler, and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead. Come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. And uh, we know what uh, happened here. Um, Jesus' story is uh, interrupted a little bit by a woman with the issue of blood. 12 years, 12 long years, and uh, she got near the Lord, and she was healed, and uh, verse 25, and the people were put forth, he went in and took her, the daughter, by the hand, and the maid arose. So he received worship here from uh, 
Jairus. Matthew 25, 15, 25, Matthew 15, 25. Jesus is the king in the book of Matthew. And here we see the king receiving worship over and over again. Matthew 15, 25. Here we have someone that, uh, again, um, that uh, would be ignored by the, by the Jews. Um, and so uh, she is, verse 22, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. That's the kingship of Christ. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. What would that be like to be a parent? Uh, we have a bowed over woman. We have a leprous man. We have a man whose daughter had died. And now we have a, a woman whose daughter is vexed uh, demonically or with a, with a devil. Devils seem to be particularly active during the ministry of Christ. Undoubtedly trying to thwart his... Uh, Thwart him before he got to the cross, uh, which would be the death knell for them and their and their leader. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Other places talk about what this did to people when people were vexed with demons, what that actually did to them. And uh, we hear about the uh, demoniacs, those men, but hear about the man with the son and what the devil did to him, throws him around. But uh, here's a daughter that way. And uh, think about yourself and what that would be like if that was your daughter. Um, <clears throat> and the disciples said, send her away. Send her away. The disciples had a bad problem with doing it. It took them a while to learn that, didn't it? Uh, what happened every time the disciples said, send them away? What happened every time? What did Jesus say back to them? Well, one time there were 5,000 hungry men and a bunch of crabbing, complaining junior church kids up on the mountainside. And we're like, oh, send them away. Is the preaching done yet? <laughs> send them away. We're almost done. We're almost done. Send them away. Jesus said, feed them. I just wish I could do that miracle some Sundays. <laughs> I don't have anything to feed them with. <laughs> they could use a snack right now. It would keep them from talking for a little bit. Send them away, send her away, send them away, send her away, send the little kids away, forbid the little kids. What did Jesus say every time? Well, he challenged this lady a little bit. In verse 24, um, she came and worshipped him and said, Lord, help me. And uh, this faith that he exhibited and her, that she exhibited and her persistence, um, made Jesus in verse 28 say, O woman, great is thy faith. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. So the Syrophoenician woman worshipped him. Matthew 20, 20. Matthew 20, 20. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him. And he received that worship. Now, her request was not so, uh, not so good. In verse 21, uh, but nonetheless, uh, she prefaced her request, uh, wrong though it might have been, uh, with worship, and Jesus received that worship. <clears throat> Matthew 14, 20, uh, 1433. So that is uh, the mother of James and John worshipped Jesus there. Matthew 14, 33. He's receiving worship. This is the uh, apostles or the disciples. Matthew 14, 33. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, 
of a truth thou art the Son of God. And uh, this was in response to the little faith um, of those in the ship in the storm. So here his apostles worshipped him. Let's look at John 9.38. John 9.38. So he received worship from the angels, from the multitudes of heaven, from everyone, from the wise men, from the leper, from Jairus, from the Syrophoenician woman, from the mother of James and John, from the apostles, John 9.38, he received worship from the blind man. Verse 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou hast seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Uh, just a couple more here. <clears throat> Let's look at um, Mark 5, 6. Mark 5, 6. Little, um, little view here into the um, world of spiritual warfare. So here's a man, verse 2, with an unclean spirit dwelling in the tombs, dwelling among the tombs, preoccupied with death. <laughs> Does today's popular shows and movies that uh, you see around uh, seem rather preoccupied with death. You hear the kids talk, don't you? Oh, that's, that's big. That's the intrigue today is, is death. And then TV is making a lot of money off death and uh, this. It's de demonic. It's, it's demonic. And uh, here is a man dwelling among the tombs. No man could bind him. S super strength, right? Non-human strength. Um, no man could bind him. No, not with chains. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains. And the chains had been plucked asunder by him. And the fetters broken in pieces. That's pretty, uh, pretty strong. And uh, they wanted to rid the uh, area put him somehow, restrain him. They couldn't, couldn't do that. <clears throat> and uh, no man could tame him. Uh, ungovernable actions. And night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying, cutting himself with stones. Right? But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. And cried with a loud voice, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God, thou torment me not. So here is the demoniac, the man as well as the unclean spirit, recognizing the person of Christ. And he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And, uh, of course, the rest of the story there. Uh, verse 15, They came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting, clothed, in his right mind. All right, sitting, clothed, in his right mind. That's only three things we can ask on Sunday, right, for the kids get on the bus? <laughs> sitting, make sure you got dressed, and be in your right mind. That'd be great. And what would happen if you saw that? You'd be afraid. <laughs> what happened to this person? <laughs> oh, my. It's a miracle. That's great. Um, so, uh, and they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil. And concerning the swine, of course, now they, they're pigs. They love their pigs. And uh, they began to pray him to part out of their coasts. So, 
Uh, verse 19, Jesus turns loose a soul winner with a testimony, doesn't he? What does he say in verse 19? Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. So uh, we have a great story there of the demoniac worshiping uh, <clears throat> Jesus. So Jesus received worship. Why? Because it proved he had divine authority. All right, so backing up to letter B, he possessed divine authority. One, he forgave sins. Two, he was held in the same honor as the Father. Three, he received worship. I have a lot of uh, verses we looked at there. But then number four, he judged man. He was a judge over men. And uh, we'll look at four passages with regard to this. He judged man. Uh, let's start in Matthew 25, 31. Matthew 25, 31. Keep it in mind here, this is the deity of Christ. The deity. These are activities of deity. Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. And before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Now who's doing this? Back up, verse 31, the Son of Man. He's talking about Himself, and they knew it. Verse 33, and He shall set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them. Did you see how that term went from son of man to king? And do you see how they are interchangeable? Do you see that? Kings judge. The son of man judges. The son of man is the king. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was unhungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? So these people that are getting this commendation aren't totally aware of the times when they actually did this that they're being commended for. When did we do that? We, didn't, we don't remember that exact time when we fed and clothed a sick, hungry uh, king. Don't remember that. When, when did we do that? I think it's a great uh, passage here in verse... Uh, uh, 38 uh, and following where Jesus describes it. When, when saw we a stranger and took the end, naked and clothed the When saw we sick in prison? And the king shall answer, this is at the judgment, and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these my brethren, the least of these my brethren, you have done it, un you have done it unto me. Done it unto me. Verse 41. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared, prepared for the devil and his angels. Not prepared for man. Sorry, John Calvin, Calvinism, I'm sorry. Not prepared for, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I wasn't hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked and ye clothed me not, sick and in prison ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer, saying, Lord, when did this happen? And we, at the end of the verse, did not minister unto thee. Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not unto the least of these, ye did it not unto me. These shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. So he the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, judges men in Matthew 25. John 5, 22. 
Second verse, we'll look at four passages. This is the second. John 5, 22. John 5, 22. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father who hath sent him. So there is uh, the judgment committed unto the Son, John 522. Uh, two, uh, two more passages here. Let's look at Acts 17:31. Acts 17:31. We look at this passage a lot. It's a good passage for our day with regard to um, society and the needs of society and the, the uh, fact that there's a lot of religion today, but there's uh, little relationship. And uh, Acts 17, <clears throat> verse 31, this is uh, Paul preaching here to the people of Athens, and he starts his message out, <clears throat> verse 24, with God as Creator, God as Creator, and then uh, <clears throat> verse 31 he goes on to the fact that God is judge. And let's see this judgment. God is creator. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he raised him from the dead. Well, in case we weren't sure what man was being talked about, it's the man that God raised from the dead. That's who is going to be the judge. And uh, so we have here Jesus judging. This is another proof of his deity. 2 Timothy 4 1. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick, the living, and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. There's the judgment by Christ. All right, capital letter uh, A, we looked at the possessing of divine attributes. Letter B, possessing divine authority. And C, possessing divine assessment. Now, as you can tell here, these, this outline was based on a little bit of a forced alliteration. So when you've got to explain your alliteration, it loses its effect. So I get to explain the alliteration here. He's called names of deity or divinity. And we're going to look at a numbers of passages where Jesus is referred to or given or um, addressed with the same titles, or names that could be said of God the Father. All right, possess divine assessment. <clears throat> we're going to look at um, 12 of these. So we'll get through a few here in the next few minutes and probably pick up with this on uh, Tuesday. So let's see what we can get done. Number one, uh, he is called God. Jesus is called God. Uh, and let's see if we can get through, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six passages. All right, John 1, 1. John 1, 1. <clears throat> John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, the Word was God. 
So there we have the Word called God. Who is the Word? John 1.14, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We know who the Word is. The Word is Jesus Christ. And uh, this passage explains itself. There is no way around uh, here unless you just um, invent a translation of John 1.1, 1, 1, which the New World Translation did do. The Jehovah's Witness Bible invented a translation of John 1.1, 1, 1, uh, where I believe it reads something like the word was a God or, or something like that. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so uh, it, that translation goes against, uh, no matter what someone's religious perspective is, it goes against uh, 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 rules of translation and grammar with regard to uh, uh, translating from Greek into English it violate that tra any translation other than this violates every rule of uh, Greek uh, uh, grammar uh, as it would uh, be translated into other languages. <clears throat> English here being the one we're dealing with, and so uh, there is no way. John 1.1 1, 1 can mean anything other than Jesus is God when we look at John 1.1 1, 1 and John 1.14. Again, the only way around that is to invent, create a translation based on someone's <coughs> false theology. And that can be done and has been done. All right, so John 1.1 1, 1 very clearly states that Jesus is God. Let's look at John 20, 28. Hopefully you'll see that this is not entirely too hard to figure out either. Even if it's one of those, I'm going to yawn a lot today because I'm just starting to get going and it's going to be one of those they said today might be like last Saturday, weather-wise. Wasn't that a blast? Wasn't that fun? Ah, it's spring. It's sunny. Oh, let me put my par parka on. I'm getting blasted in a blizzard. Oh, it's spring. It's sunny. It's great. The birds are singing. Look at the wonderful flowers blooming. Oh, look at the snowplow truck. It just came by and plowed me full of snow here. The salt trucks are out. Five minutes later, five. I don't know what to do. Like, odd day. Um, so they... Uh, said today might be one of those special days. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, see what this uh, statement is here by Thomas? He's talking to Jesus, right? <laughs> my Lord and what? My God. That's pretty clear, what you say. My Lord and my God. So <clears throat> he's called God. Um, let's look at uh, Romans 9, 5. Romans 9, 5. Uh, this is the passage of Paul's burden, heaviness, sorrow for his countrymen. Verse 4, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all Christ, is over all God, blessed forever. So God is um, the um, renaming here of the word Christ. Christ who came in the flesh. So he is called God here in Romans 9, 5. Hebrews 1, 8. Hebrews 1, 8. We'll just read a little bit of this verse. 
But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God. So if um, God calls the Son God, that's pretty valid source, wouldn't you say? If God calls the Son God. God, then those that believe in God but don't believe in the deity of Christ have a problem, don't they? They better de decide what God they're talking about because the God of the Bible called the Son God. Titus 2.13 Titus 2.13 looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, <clears throat> that sentence structure, both in Greek and English, are set in a way that the great God is the same as Jesus Christ. The Savior, Jesus Christ, is the great God. There's a grammatical structure that's set up. Some may want to keep that separate, but you can't do that. That's not the way that sentence uh, is uh, set up and reads. So the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, Titus 2.13. And then lastly, today we'll end with this, 1 John 5.20. 1 John 5.20. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life.